Thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you also to Katrina McCallum uh, for the invitation to talk to you uh, this morning. So I want to talk about uh, research and researcher evaluation, and um, I guess I'm here partly because I am myself a researcher, although I seem to spend more and more time at meetings like this, uh, sort of talking about science rather than uh, actually doing science, but I am a structural biologist from time to time uh, in the Department of Life Sciences at Imperial College. I'm also currently Director of Undergraduate Studies there. Uh, but I think I'm also here because I'm a science blogger and I've been sort of writing on my blog about the scientific life and about uh, issues like publication and open access and evaluation uh, for a number of years now. Uh, I also have a sort of campaigning hat, I'm vice chair of the campaign group Science is Vital in the UK, which is getting active again uh, at the moment, a board member of the Campaign for Science and Engineering. And I was, until it sort of completed its work earlier this year, a member of the HFC Metrics Review, which was looking at the use of metrics in evaluation. So I want to talk a little bit about that uh, in my remarks this morning. Uh, so um, I want to start actually with a confession, okay? And what I want to say is that I can't tell you how much I hate open access. It's too hard. It's too complicated. When Katrina invited me to give this talk, I thought, that's, you know, and it was a couple of months ago, I thought, okay, that's good. I'll have plenty of time. I'll sit down. I'll get my thoughts in order. Uh, I'll be able to sort of really come up with a really nice presentation. And I'll have sort of figured out my position on it once and for all, and I'll be able to sort of lay before you a very nice presentation. But somehow the summer came and went, and uh, as you see, I have many hats, and so all my other duties seem to sort of grab my attention. So I'm a bit less prepared for this morning than I wanted to be. So I want you to regard my talk this morning as something of a preprint. Uh, which is something that I've been getting a little bit enthusiastic about uh, of late, and I will submit it uh, to you for post-publication peer review. So all I would ask is that you be kind. So, but it's hard. But it, it, evaluation is an important thing. It's an important aspect of the life of a researcher, and it intersects in very intimate ways, as we've already heard several times at this meeting, with the processes of publication and, of course, with the, the rise of open access. But we cannot escape evaluation, and in my capacity as Director of Undergraduate Studies, I have to process the data that comes from our students. In the UK, all universities uh, are evaluated by final year students in a wonderful exercise called the National Student Survey, uh, where students get to write uh, about their experience at university. And this was my favorite comment from one of our students uh, this year. <laughs> it's too hard, I just want it first. <laughs> Okay, so, and that's how I feel about open access sometimes. It's too hard. I just want open access to happen. But unfortunately, the world doesn't work like that. Uh, and um, uh, there were um, uh, other sort of nastier evaluations of our good efforts to educate our students. Uh, but actually, this is the best evaluation I personally uh, have ever had, uh, which came from the good offices of social media. Uh, unfortunately, it turns out and this indicates one of the technical problems with evaluation. This, there's a confusion of identity here. He was talking about the real Stephen Curry, uh, who is younger, taller, <laughs> better looking, more athletic than me, and the NBA's most valued player uh, this year. But I've got the gorgeous red hair, so it's not all going his way. Even when there isn't confusion of identity, it can sometimes be hard to evaluate who's done what. And uh, this is another example of another of my hats. At Mon Monday, I'm a theater viewer as well, wouldn't you know? Uh, on Monday night, there's, I've got to go to a play in the West End, a new play about uh, the, solving the structure of DNA. So, and it centers around the character of Rosalind Franklin, but obviously the other players, Watson and Crick and Wilkins, are also in the game. And many, of course, in this room will have heard uh, the, the story of the, solving the structure of DNA. It's a kind of infamous story. It was given infamy, particularly when Watson published his book in 1968, 10 years after Franklin had died and had no comeback, and he was really rather nasty to her in the book, somewhat denigrated. There was a big backlash to that. And there is a myth now that, you know, uh, she was wrong because she was a woman and they stole her data and they, in order to win the Nobel Prize and sort of, uh, and do her down. 
And certainly it wasn't all peaches and apple pie, but the, the actual truth of the matter, which is explored quite well in the play, I thought, uh, is a lot more complicated than that. And so when you are trying to evaluate the uh, uh, contributions of researchers uh, to the scientific life, it's actually a hard thing to do. So evaluation is very hard, even when you have lots of time to figure out all the information. But it's something that's important uh, to do, uh, and it's important that we do well. And when things get very complicated, when it gets really hard, then I think it's important to try and return to first principles to remind yourself and rediscover why it is we're in this business uh, in the first place. So coming back to my title, it's easy enough to uh, evaluate yourself if you are wealthy enough to own a, a yacht. <laughs> but uh, I'm talking about research and researchers, few of whom, as, as I understand it, own yachts. Craig Venter is the only one I'm aware of that has a, a, a large ocean-going yacht. I don't, I don't have one. But these are the things I want to talk about, research, researchers, and value. But I also want to talk about uh, values as well, and I think these are the key elements uh, in the story that we are trying to explore, or that I'm trying to explore this morning, and how those uh, different factors and different players uh, intersect in the process of evaluation and how that impacts the process of publication and the rise of open access. Now, uh, let's talk about researchers, because I think it's very important to try and understand researchers, and that's one of the perspectives I, I want to give. I don't know if I'm necessarily typical in terms of my understanding. Uh, so this is a picture of four academics grapp grappling with the, uh, the digital world. It's slightly tongue-in-cheek, okay? So uh, many scientists and researchers are, of course, very familiar with the, how the digital world works. Many of them contributed to the rise of the digital world. But bless their little hearts, there are some of them, and I think this is particularly true when uh, it comes to thinking about how the rise of the digital world has impacted publishing, where we do need to do a better job of educating researchers about the threats, but also the wonderful opportunities that arise uh, have arisen from this. We are uh, very much swamped in a, a modern world, and there are many good things um, that come from that, but also um, many dangers. So if we want to understand researchers, we've got to think back about, you know, why is it that people do research? And people come to it for many different motivations. I don't think in order to earn enough money to buy a yacht. Uh, but if I think back to myself and I talk to my colleagues, you know, we're quite an idealistic bunch of people, uh, all in all. We want to understand the world. We're often driven by intense curiosity. Even we're even curious in things that pretty much nobody else is interested in. That's one of the defining features of uh, the, the scientific life, as it were. Many of us want to change the world. We want to make it a better place. We want to find cures for uh, horrible diseases. We want to develop vaccines. We want to develop new technologies and make the world a more interesting place uh, to live in, as well as you know, understanding the mystery of our uh, place in the cosmos. And there's a huge amount of ego at play here. We want to be remembered. Okay, uh, We want to be immortal as much as it is possible to be. Uh, and we're quite you know, we will settle for a few hundred years of, uh, you know, the lifetime of a piece of paper, uh, which may well turn out to be longer than the sort of uh, lifetime of our digital storage technologies uh, as uh, presently incarnated. But, you know, many egos are at play, and of course many people in the publishing industry will have come across the egos uh, of uh, academic researchers. But those are the things that motivate us, and we've got to understand you know, where those people are. And if we are hoping to encourage them to you know, use open access more and to publish more thoughtfully and more rapidly and do it better, then we've got to understand the factors that, uh, that drive them. But you know, we are, they are uh, struggling, grappling um, with the digital world. And that digital world brings with it, of course, fantastic things. This is a, a wonderful photograph from the very wonderful opening ceremony of the 2012 Olympic Games in London. There's a tiny figure of Tim Berners-Lee down there in the middle of the stage. But, you know, this is for everyone. Who could have thought 20 years ago that we would be here today wrapped in the World Wide Web uh, with the sort of immediate access to so much information um, all around the world? There are many wonderful things uh, that, of course, have accrued to us uh, through the Internet. But the digitization and the computerization of the world means now that we can track human activity in many different ways relatively easily. We can count the things that people do. We can figure out where they go. We can track you know, their purchases online, uh, how many downloads they make. And so we have now there is a sort of, I think, a myth-building app that because we have that capacity, actually we can measure all of human life. 
And I would like to suggest that it's not quite as uh, simple as just counting all the various aspects of activity. There are dangers. This is GCHQ uh, in the UK, so uh, they're doing an awful lot of digital measurement, uh, apparently tapping in every single blooming phone call and email that uh, goes back and forth between people, the good citizens of the UK uh, and the rest of the world. Uh, so there's an opportunity that uh, we didn't have 20 years ago. Uh, whether or not that's a good thing or not is a matter for um, uh, rigorous and uh, loud democratic debate, which I don't think we really had yet, uh, certainly in the UK. Now, measurement ha very much has its uses, okay? I'm not denigrating it, and if you're sort of trying to use numbers to evaluate things, it's not necessarily a bad thing. There are many areas of human activity where it's important and valuable. If you're in the manufacturing industry, of course, and many manufacturing industries these days operate on just-in-time uh, sort of stock control, so they want to be able to track when parts are coming in, when they're going out, the productivity of the workers, how much money they're making you know, per unit widget that they produce. And if your bottom line is money and making a profit, that's an important number to be able to track. And so it's very valuable to be able to count and measure all those sorts of activities. Even in the public sector, if you're trying to run a hospital, we have the wonderful NHS. It strains for, for money every year, but uh, many of us are very proud of it. Uh, but it, it can always work better. It can work more efficiently. And in order to do that, you need to be able to track bed usage and occupancy, you need to be able to assess you know, success rates in operations and try and make some evaluation of the, uh, the efficiency and the professionalism, the, the medical staff that uh, are working there. So there are many uh, areas of human activity that this uh, rise of digital measurement and evaluation um, can, can come across. And of course, it has seeped into academia as well. Uh, everybody has heard, we all know about you know, journal impact factors, and I'll certainly talk about that in a moment, but you know, university rankings is something that, again, didn't really exist uh, 10 or more years ago, and now it's become an obsession. Okay, And this is the Times Higher rank, it's one of 10 or so uh, different products that are out there um, on the market. Uh, Caltech has a score of 94.9 somethings. Okay, don't know what the unit of measurement is, not stated, so they're losing a mark for that already uh, in terms of my assessment. But uh, universities obsess. I got an email yesterday uh, from our dean of the Faculty of Natural Sciences. The table came out yesterday about the top 100 innovative universities uh, in the world. You know, Imperial is number 11 if you're interested. I certainly am not. Okay. <laughs> the... You know, what are we measuring here? Okay, so this is a complex business. What does a university do? Okay, it does research, it teaches uh, students, it interacts with the rest of society, hopefully in constructive and interesting ways to sort of uh, stimulate and engage uh, public debate. Uh, it provides a nice working environment for its staff. It has nice halls of residence for its students. It has a reputation, which is judged by various shades of opinion around the world. And all of those things are factored into the sort of six different categories that the Times does. They, they are at least open about their methodology, and they come up with a number. Now, what they don't come up with is a standard error uh, in that number. So is that actually a significant uh, ranking of universities. Everybody blithely assumes that it is, but it, it isn't, okay? And unless they can come up with those data, and they can't come up with those data, which is why they resist to publish them, then we don't know. So we are giving, and the trouble when you start using numbers is that they have a, this seductive objectivity. It's a number, it's a quantity, it is objective, it has authority. And we forget that actually behind that number is a massive amount of subjective opinion. And subjective opinion is a good thing because people are good at making sophisticated judgments, but we have to, but the trouble is, you know, we, we just end up with a number. If we boil things down to a number, then uh, we start to get into, uh, into real trouble. So uh, in a world where they have the rise of numbers, you know, we have problems. This is an absolutely diabolical film. If you have seen it already, my sympathies, it was awful, wasn't it? <laughs> If you haven't seen it, don't bother. Uh, so what happens when the numbers run out? Okay, knowing it's uh, starring Nicolas Cage. He has done much better work. What happens when the numbers run out? Uh, very bad things, okay, is what happens at the, you know, the end of the world, basically. Okay, uh, but we are in a world kind of, is, you know, where we have to ask ourselves, well, what happens when the numbers take over? 
And that can also be sometimes very bad things, okay, because we can get judgments uh, and evaluations uh, wrong. So we do need to be always thinking and challenging ourselves when we are using these kinds of data, even though we have ready access to it. You know, what are we doing when we are applying it to evaluating researchers and to directing human um, activity? So metrics very much on the rise. It's very much a, a, a topical subject among researchers, given the rise of the impact factor and the, the way that it's used to uh, evaluate researchers. In the UK, so every six years or so, the whole university sector submits itself to a thing called the uh, Research Excellence Framework, okay? And that anodyne term conceals uh, two or three years of absolute hell uh, for heads of department around the country where they try to uh, a set, a, a, a cull together sort of four papers per researcher and then write complicated uh, sort of justifications and explanations of the quality of their research and the impact um, that it has. It's a very burdensome exercise. Everybody engages with it because it's money at stake. Uh, so about two billion pounds a year uh, in the UK is dispersed to universities based on their performance uh, as judged in the research excellence framework. So you want to get a good score. You want to be a four-star department, uh, basically, uh, if you can. So uh, about a year ago then, uh, the uh, government asked HEFSI, the Higher Education Funding Council of England, which sort of also actually takes care of it, uh, or I'll oversaw it for the rest of the UK as well, to look, you know, is there a way that we could make this whole exercise easier? We just use metrics, okay? Let's just calculate, you know, a H index for each department and figure out the money on that basis, okay? You know, is there, is there a scope for doing that? Would that be a reasonable thing to do? And that was the, the brief that the, uh, that the committee was given. So it was David Willits, uh, sadly missed, uh, off, uh, quite a good uh, minister for uh, universities and science in the UK. So it was he initiated, so, someone I guess known to this audience, very interested in open access as well. But the idea was the review would consider the robustness of metrics across different disciplines and assess their potential contributions to the development of research excellence uh, and impact. So the, uh, the, it was a motley crew assembled uh, in the steering group, chaired by James Wilson, who's a professor of science and democracy at, at uh, Sussex University. And it was quite a mixed bag. I was on the uh, committee, I think because I was a blogger who'd written about research evaluation. Uh, so, uh, but also, you know, Philip Campbell, now Sir Philip Campbell, uh, knighted in the recent honours list, who's editor of Nature. Uh, Eleonora is an academic also, but a humanities scholar. Remind myself, I've always seen the sciences. Uh, Liz Allen from the Wellcome Trust. Richard Jones, who represents the Royal Society. Roger Kane from the British Academy, the Royal Society for Humanities Scholars, basically. Uh, we had research managers. Uh, Mike is a bioinformatician, as was Paul Wouters, uh, uh, who's, in the, he's, who's at Leiden. Uh, and then Ian Viney was also at the, um, representing the research council. So quite a mixed uh, bag of stakeholders. We had a year. We were very independent. It wasn't really a sort of government diktat about what we could do. And we went through the process over the course of from sort of about uh, April, May last year until July uh, this year. We had broad terms of reference uh, and we interpreted them as openly as possible. We wanted to open up discussion as widely as possible within the, the UK uh, on these issues. We had a very transparent process. All the minutes were published uh, in real time. All the evidence that we gathered in uh, was published on HEFSI's website as well. And so the process involved, we had an uh, open call for evidence. We had 153 responses, which then amounted to nearly 1,000 pages of evidence from various stakeholders across the, uh, across the sector, individual academics, but also uh, uh, sort of societies and companies uh, and institutions as well. We had many events uh, over the course of the year. We had open meetings and invitations. Also, we even invited some of our fiercest critics who had written you know, very trenchant material in the responses. Uh, we conducted an in-depth literature review, which was uh, largely written by Paul Wouters and um, Mike Thule on the current state of bibliometrics and you know, what's the reliability of this data. And there's an awful lot of interest in bibliometrics, but there's an awful lot of sort of understanding that it's very much an imperfect world. We cannot easily measure the quality of academic work through uh, just sort of metric work. And then there was a quantitative correlation exercise where they tried to use metrics to analyze the data of the ref that had just happened, which was the 2014 one, to see could we have predicted the outcome. At the moment, the ref scores are assigned by 
panels of academics who you know, read the submissions, read the papers that are submitted, and come up with a judgment, and actually then also come up with a score for each uh, paper, and then that's aggregated uh, for each department within every university. So we wanted to see, you know, could we predict uh, those outcomes? So it was a very thorough piece of work. This, it's published in three lengthy documents. There is fortunately a, a, a very brief and readable uh, executive summary, which you can download um, from the website. I just want to sort of give the headline uh, figures. So the main conclusion. So the main conclusion and the main theme that emerged from uh, the report, and it was titled um, The Metric Tide, okay, so there was a slightly ominous uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, aspect to that, I think, which is, was deliberate and conscious. We are uh, surrounded by numbers. There is a rising tide of the, the way that we, people are using uh, numerical data in order to make assessments. And that isn't going to go away. That's the world that we live in. But if we are going to live in that world, then we need to do, do so responsibly. Okay, so we want people to use it responsibly. <laughs> One of those uh, aspects of that is mining your language, and actually generally felt that the term indicators is a more honest term than metric, because metric implies that you've measured something. And very often you're just counting something and you're using that as a proxy. So you count citations and you say, this is a very good paper because it has 150 citations. Well, not necessarily all the case. It might have 150 citations because there's 150 people think it's a pile of crap, and they have said so uh, in some other paper uh, in the literature. So you always have to look uh, at context. So indicator, I think, is a, is a more honest uh, term. Metrics or indicators inform but do not replace human judgment, do not replace peer review. And the vast majority of people who responded and submitted to the uh, report uh, were sort of in horror that you know, uh, a metrics-only ref process would be brought in uh, to the UK as a result of this exercise. And you know, many argued very passionately you know, that that would be a, a very bad thing to do. As it turns out, uh, that was the conclusion of the analysis that was made. There were some positive correlations between different metrics um, but, uh, and the outcomes of the REF, but the correlation coefficients were all relatively low, 0 0.2, 0 0.2 to 0 0.4 um, at best. So as a predictive tool at the moment, certainly in our current technology, it's a no-go in terms of uh, this sort of exercise overall. We also want you know, institutions to be transparent about their use. Okay, and this applies more generally even to individuals. We would like universities to make a clear statement of the principles for assessment. You know, why are they doing assessment? What are they how are they going to do it? And if they use metrics, how do they justify that? Okay, and you know, we would leave it to institutions to come up with their own rationales, but we want them to be transparent about it. As part of that, we would like them to have a dialogue with staff because often metrics are used at the sort of upper echelons of the university, but not necessarily lower down, and staff feel disengaged from the process um, as a result. And we also would urge them not to delegate measures of excellence to league tables or uh, to journals, okay, to do assessment properly by looking holistically at what their staff are doing. And you know, many of these recommendations, and there are more, which you will find in the, there's 20 in total, uh, which you'll find in the uh, executive summary, they're not necessarily breaking new ground because a lot of other people, of course, are thinking along these lines uh, as well. And it very much picks on the spirit and philosophy of both the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment, which I hope everyone in this room has heard of, and also then the more recent Leiden Manifesto, which was written by Paul Wouters and several of his bibliometrics colleagues, which is about making being about the bibliometric community taking more of the responsibility for ensuring that the tools that they are used, that they are developing, are uh, um, explained and used in a responsible way. So we do have to think about context and meaning uh, in all of these things. So when we're thinking about evaluating research and uh, motivating it, then you know, we want to try and understand, well, what actually is good research? And when I sat down to think about this, uh, I think there are a number of different dimensions to it. There's not one thing that you can capture with one number. It's, I think, you know, transformative understanding. We think of the sort of major breakthroughs that we've had in recent years, structure of DNA, RNAi, the Higgs boson, for example, things that have really changed our understanding of reality. Transformative methods, new developments, X-ray crystallography, personal favorite of mine, but also the polymerase chain reaction and CRISPR, which I think is a a shoe in to win its discoverers a Nobel Prize, with, if not this year, then next year or the year after. 
transformative technologies, the silicon chip, of course, uh, the graphene being the most uh, recent and most notable example, and also transformative impact, impact of research on the world, changes in policy, new ways of sort of doing things in the social sphere, behavioral changes, new legislation. All of those things are important aspects, important qualities uh, that come out of research and that are part of the motivations for researchers in getting involved in it uh, in the first place. They're complex um, and they're multidimensional. But how do we actually measure good research these days? Okay. We measure it, publication in a high impact fact journal. Okay. Publish in Nature, it's good research. Okay. Publish in Science, it's good research. That is what people think, for, for good or ill, no one designed it that way, but that has risen and that is now a deeply embedded uh, fact of life in the research culture. No one is to blame for it, and I'm not sitting here in front of publishers saying, well, the publishers, you know, they've published all these impact factors, you know, they started it. Uh, it's a culture that has arisen, nobody designed it that way, uh, and it's maintained, I think, by pretty much all parties uh, in the game. We count citations, we look at H-indexes, uh, which is a slightly clever way of counting citations, um, but is also quite a good way of measuring how old you are. Expert evaluation tends to come down the bottom of the list, and we tend, we like to rely on researchers, certainly, that, you know, and I know it from my own experience and practice, like to rely on these sorts of things because it's easy. They are good proxies. Everybody sort of understands them. I'm busy, okay? If I am trying to assess a piece of work or somebody who works in exactly my field, I can do it quite easily just by reading the abstracts of their paper or even, you know, it doesn't take me long to read their papers. I can do that. Shift me slightly outside my comfort zone, RNA viruses uh, from, you know, 1973 to 1984, uh, then I'm often struggling a bit, you know, and I will then, you know, I think, you know, is this piece of work, is it, you know, a breakthrough, is it transformative or is it incremental? And I will find it difficult to do that. And I will then sort of, you know, glance, lift the page and, oh, what was the impact factor of that journal? I've not heard of it before. And so, you know, one relies on the easy thing because we are, we are time poor and we're pressed. But we are doing ourselves a disservice and having allowed ourselves to get into this sorry state, we really have to dig our way out. So our present culture sustains traditional publishing models. There's a lot of transformation has come through. Lots of good things are happening, and we heard of many of them, many of them today and uh, yesterday and the day before at, at this conference. But I think there's a sense also that it's not happening fast enough, that we can do better and that we should be doing better. And part of the break on that process is, of course, our embedded culture um, of evaluation. So the present culture, well, what are the benefits of the present culture? Well, arguably, uh, the high bar to entry spurs the high bar to entry into top journals spurs people to be uh, to compete and to do their best work and to sort of push and do really great stuff and so that they get into the top journals. It's a, it's a good thing. It's a positive driving force for good science. That's one argument. There are downsides. That high bar for entry, it slows publication. People are chasing after the top journals with the highest impact factors, so they'll aim high and they'll work their way down the hierarchy. Uh, I talked to somebody at the Royal Society meeting in uh, April, May, who was on their 10th resubmission to a journal. Okay, thought they'd done some of their best work in this paper and had spent uh, over a year, nearly two years, trying to get it uh, into work. So it's slowing down pu publication and that reduces researcher productivity. That's not good, okay? We have limited funds, we have limited time on this earth, uh, we wanna do the most with it. Uh, we are, have peer review, has many strengths, many people benefit from it, but it is an inherently conservative process, it's often biased. Uh, we had a horrendous case of sexism uh, from a peer of year earlier this year, which uh, sort of caught the, uh, the, uh, caught the news. Eye-catching research sometimes trumps quality. Remember Arsenic Life, anybody? Published in Science, a pile of uh, you-know-what. Uh, we have an impact factor-based uh, reward system. It's very highly geared, and that encourages people to cheat. And last night, as I was putting this slides, I came across this report in an Australian newspaper of a diabetes researcher there who has admitted fabricating data in order to get published in the Journal uh, of the American Medical Association and is now, unfortunately, in, in disgrace as a result. But, you know, responsible for their actions, but also to some degree a, you know, a victim of a very vicious and competitive uh, system. Uh, it restricts access, of course, and it's, you know, traditional publishing models are a poor fit to public policy in the digital age. We can do better. 
So I want to try and reimagine scientific publication in the open era, and I'm very much influenced by the a meeting that I attended in the Royal Society uh, earlier in the spring. This is a bit of a thought experiment. I'm not suggesting that I've worked this all out and I have a business plan and I'm launching my uh, new uh, mega journal tomorrow, but I think it helps to, to think through this way. It helps me. I'd like to see a system of universal preprints like the archive. Of course, we now have the bio archive and we have uh, peer J preprints and various other uh, outlets for that. This provides very rapid dissemination. It breaks through the, uh, the log jam created by the endless resubmission in order to, ch to chase after impact factors. It encourages very constructive criticism from the community. So on the archive and certainly in the bioarchive, people are noticing that actually uh, other researchers are prepared to comment because actually in ways that they don't on uh, sort of normal journal uh, uh, sites, because I think it's felt that if they make a comment, actually they can change the paper before the final version then is, uh, reaches the public domain. So it encourages a, a very constructive engagement. Uh, ideally, we would figure out some way of comment or credit uh, that was sort of transferable and universally sort of understood. I'd have open access mega journals uh, all round. I'd have open PLOS style peer review. You know, is it original? Has it been done well? If so, then let's publish it. Okay, I would have that sort of uh, uh, style of peer review. None of this, is it good enough for this journal? Okay, I think that's holding back um, research. The sort of, uh, that, that style of peer review is better suited to publishing confirmatory studies, which you struggle to get into top journals, or even negative results, uh, which are a very important and uh, uh, hidden part of the uh, scientific enterprise. I'd have credit for reviewers in the same way that I have commenter credits. Uh, competition on uh, service and price, because we want value for money, and that is something I think that actually researchers aren't sensitive enough to. And we'd have universal access, and more readers gives us more scrutiny, because we'd have less cheating if the world could read it, and then, because that's the best way to pick up uh, flaws, not necessarily cheating, but even mistakes, you know, honest errors, plenty of those, and I've made uh, some in my own career. I hope I have never uh, actually cheated. And of course, you get accessible data and software, data deposition, software deposition, and uh, goes along with the paper. I think everybody understands that that simply uh, has to happen. It's already happening. It's a big, big challenge because uh, data formats are many and various. Um, but also, again, deposition of data is a disincentive to fraud uh, because, you know, where is the fraudster going to hide uh, if it's evident that they have synthetic data? There are downsides and challenges to this. Oh. Hello. <laughs> I'm all into sort of open and collaborative uh, things, but, <laughs> but not during my bloody talk. <laughs> so now there are sort of downsides and challenges to this wonderful open world that I uh, we would like to imagine. There's quality concerns about the pay to publish model. Of course, we're familiar with the Bahannon Sting, Jeffrey Beals blacklist. Uh, and comments about open access, this idea about vanity publishing, because you have to pay. People seem to forget that actually we've been paying page charges and charges for color figures for years, and we never get paid for writing, so you know, the whole enterprise is vanity publishing. Um, but I think all of those concerns, and some of them are very serious, they are simply you know, very much mitigated by openness. Okay? It may be, if, you're, if it's vanity publishing and it's, a, it's not very good, then if it's open access, people will tell you it's not very good. So that that really helps. Delegation of quality control to the reader, if you have an awful lot of sort of post-publication peer review, that's um, uh, something that some people will be uncomfortable with. I think perhaps in medical research it may be slightly risky, but it was very interesting to hear yesterday about the idea of getting patients involved uh, in peer review. So again, I think the openness can help to mitigate these risks. But there are also big, big questions. You know, it's about getting the incentives right, because the researchers are very much uh, at the core of these problems. We need you know, post-publication reward mechanisms that are independent of journals, OK? At the minute, it's all dependent on journals. They're wrapped up together. They're bound in this sort of uh, uh, fight, to, fight to the death, as it were. Uh, and it's really not helping the whole uh, of the research enterprise. If we were to use preprints, I think that helps, and I think this is true in the communities that use the archive, it really helps to focus attention on the content and not the wrapper, and the content is far more important um, than the wrapper, as any consumer of a Mars bar uh, knows. 
Funders and institutions could start to reward you know, speed of publication. You know, why don't they incentivize their researchers to publish in uh, preprints and be speedy and about being open? They already have uh, mandates, but and it's good to see that you know, those are, are, are tightening up. I'd like us to see you know, evaluation of academics on every single thing that they do. Research is one part um, of my job, you know, but uh, there's many other things. You know, I do research plus, I do teaching, um, I do this sort of thing, talking to uh, publishers, I you know, talk to students, I, I write about science, I do public engagement, and I, you know, I so see Dora for uh, advice on how to go about that. We do need to expose academics to price to make them sensitive to it. Uh, I think funders need to get tough uh, about this. And, you know, there is a debate here to be had about the, the sort of balance between academic freedom and academic responsibility. And my sense is that academics are very good at shouting about OE freedom, uh, and, but need to be a little bit more aware, I think, of their responsibilities, if, particularly if they are taking the coin of the realm, the coin of the taxpayer, uh, or even of a charitable funder. And we also need to dethrone the impact factor in every uh, way that we can. And one of the ways that you know, I've been trying to promote to do this would be to get all journals to publish the citation distributions on which their impact factors are based. I don't for a moment think that we'll ever get to a world where people decide, yes, we'll get rid of impact factors, OK? The world will get rid of nuclear weapons before it gets rid um, of impact factors. Uh, but if we can publish citation distributions, it, again, it provides more information. And in this transparent digital age, we can do that easily. Publishers um, have access to this information. Uh, the price sensitivity, I think, is important in the UK. So I'm in, involved in Science is Vital. Uh, there's a comprehensive spending review scheduled for November. Uh, the Research Council have been instructed by the ministry that runs them to model cuts to the science budget of between 25 and 40 percent, okay? So money is already tight. Uh, the RCUK policy hasn't been a big winner necessarily among academics in the UK because they think they're going to spend 60 million on open access and that's carved out of the research budget. And there's a lot of people think that money could be better spent just doing the blooming research. This is going to be, you know, uh, I don't know if it'll come to 25 to 40 percent, but we are looking at cuts. Public finances in the UK are not in a good state. If it comes to that, hands up any publishers who are going to model 25 to 40 percent cuts uh, in the fees that they charge to the research community in order to help us out. No takers. So we're facing tough situations, and that's why we really do need to make academics sensitive on value for money uh, from the public purse. But anyway, this, coming back to citation distributions, again, uh, you know, everybody in the room I think is familiar with graphs like this. These, this is so Nature Materials uh, uh, in 2010 did an analysis of you know where did the impact factor come from, and they showed, of course, this classic characteristic skewed distribution. Uh, vast majority of papers published have uh, numbers of citations which are below the impact factor. Only uh, two-thirds of the papers perform less well than the GIF. And so they are, in a sense, riding on the coattails of the relatively small number of papers that attract very no great numbers of citations. And there's over two orders of magnitude range uh, in the numbers of citations that papers get. So if you are relying on a GIF for your measure of quality, you are being dishonest, as well as being, as I like to say, um, statistically uh, illiterate. It's a poor measure of performance. And even if you look at individual researchers uh, and look at the way that they publish, then uh, it's difficult to actually to use the GIF that they publish to predict how well they perform in the future or how well the rest of their work performs. So there are, again, positive correlations here, but some of them really aren't very big. And this is just a sort of random sample of, of different researchers. So using the GIF as a measure of esteem, as a measure of evaluation, is a horribly bad practice, and yet it's deeply, deeply entrenched. We cannot change it tomorrow, but we can take at least baby steps, and I think you know, publishing citation distributions is one of those simple, feasible baby steps that we can do that may actually uh, have quite a transformative effect. So I would ask, you know, I challenge all publishers here and uh, elsewhere to publish your annual citation distributions alongside the GIF. Show researchers where it comes from, okay? We are asked to show the data when we write papers, so let's all do the same thing. So the Embo Journal and PeerJ have already committed um, to this practice. I heard from at least two publishers at this meeting that they're uh, very seriously considering it and adopting the practice, and I am um, poking at various others. So, you know, who's going to be next? Hopefully next year uh, that list will be much longer uh, among here. Um, and it's, again, it's, you know, it's, it's one of those little things. It only sometimes takes a little nudge, but sometimes there can be a really big payoff for it. 
and I think it would help to move us to a process where uh, we can do a much better job um, of research uh, evaluation. How, again, and sort of, and finally, how it interacts with um, uh, sort of the whole publishing process. Again, I'm being a bit idealistic here, but you know, do we need selective uh, journals to foster high quality research? I think, you know, for many people, they would say the answer to that question is undoubtedly yes. But I think actually now it's a question that one can plausibly ask. In the digital age, when it's, uh, you know, easy for us to find uh, the information that we're looking for, do we need sort of selective and disciplinary journals to promote a particular piece of research? There are probably better ways through social media and through the web that, uh, that we can pick that up. Do we need journals to foster disciplines and subdisciplines? I think probably all learned societies would say absolutely yes, you know, that's our job, but maybe there are different ways that they could do that, having overlay journals where they, as societies, sort of uh, add value by extracting from the archives the papers that they think are most interesting and then promoting them or trying to detect, you know, the, the rise of new and interesting sort of fields and sub-disciplines uh, within the fields. These are discussions that I think, you know, that are starting to happen and that, that have to happen. So it's a complicated, I don't have any easy solutions uh, for it. I was very, very taken by the phrase that uh, Jennifer Hansen from the Gates Foundation uh, said uh, yesterday, the work is complicated. Now, the Gates Foundation talk about eradicating polio and solving world poverty and whatnot. Most researchers aren't necessarily fixated on those sorts of problems, but actually our work is still complicated. I think many of us think it's still valuable. Many of us are involved in those sorts of things. And if it's complicated, you know, um, why we do it is not, okay? So we are, you know, we have very strong motivations, and I think we can do it better. You know, I really applaud the, the moves by the Gates Foundation. I'd like to see them move further and faster by incorporating preprints into their policy, uh, but one step at a time. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'll be very happy to take questions. Morning. Thank you for the presentation, uh, Richard Winery Systems. Um, research funders spend about 1.6 trillion a year, and they pay scholarly publishers about 10 billion a year to evaluate those outcomes, uh, which is less than 0.05 percent. And I'm wondering whether they're uh, being realistic about what they're asking publishers to do to help improve the evaluation process. So I'm thinking about things like credit, which is a way to evaluate what people did on a manuscript or to structure uh, what people did. And everyone says, okay, this is a great new thing. You know, every author we're going to see, did they do the research? Did they do the funding? Did they do the data curation? Um, but actually implementing something like that is very costly on a per manuscript basis. And even in your presentation today, you talked about pushing the APC down. Uh, and it seems to be like contradictory incentives to publishers. Yes, we want more, but we want to pay less for it. So I'm wondering if research funders could be more realistic about what they want and then paying for it. Okay, but you talk about, you know, the research funders pay publishers uh, 10 billion to do this assessment. How much of that money do publishers pay the researchers who actually do the assessment? So there is a factor there that I think you're overlooking. And what I want to see so that is a, a functioning market. I am absolutely not saying, well, we should have all these great things for free, okay? We shouldn't pay people for it. We should pay the market rate, okay? But at the minute, in the subscription model, we don't have a functioning market because the journals are not fungible in the sort of uh, the terminology of uh, economics. I think with an open access market where, you know, one moves to a gold world, then there will be, uh, competition on price for service, and if we make authors sensitive to that, then they will look around. You know, they'll want sort of good quality peer review, perhaps good post-production, nice layout, uh, or the figures, uh, uh, speedy service, and those sorts of things. And I think if we move to that, we can have a functioning market. People can make a good living out of it. Many publishers, it seems to me, do make an extremely good living uh, out of the out of the present system. And I think, you know, I think there are um, efficiency savings to be had. We, as, you know, uh, the major publishers make uh, profits that are the envy of most of the rest of the commercial world. Well, l let me sharpen my question because I didn't want to. I, I mean, get into a OA and sort of discussion about that. But just maybe more specifically, then. 
you've got an initiative like the Credit Project, which um, is tremendously useful and has huge potential impact in terms of, you know, not only just looking at a map. I, I mean, to me, it's astonishing today that we have 20 authors on a manuscript and yet we don't know what they all did. I mean, no business would really run like that. Uh, you, you know, so, so it's a very, very important initiative. But I th the risk is that it'll just die on the vine because there's no incentive for, for people, there's no financial incentive for people to actually implement it in their peer review processes, um, deal with all the hassle of going to an author and saying, okay, now tell me what each of your colleagues did, and then when those people argue, no, I did this, I did that, now the publisher has to unravel that, the publisher's going to get accused of not publishing good data if there's not, you know, traceability on that. So it's a big hassle for the publisher to take this on. How do we get it to happen? Because I agree, I, it would be good for it to happen. Well, I think that the credit system is good, but I wouldn't want it to become over elaborate and over cumbersome. I mean, when I sort of sit down to write papers, it is hard to sort of partition out, okay, how do you rank the authors? Who, you know, you figure out who's going to be first, who's going to be last, and then there's a bunch of people in the middle. I mean, I think it's useful nowadays that they, they have these statements in the papers, which is just written by the author about, you know, who did, what was the particular contribution. But I wouldn't, I don't necessarily, you know, I, there's a certain value in the transparency of that, but in terms of actually then summing up little numbers of credit and, you know, what's the percentage contribution, I mean, that will just waste, uh, you know, another day a week of researcher time and, you know, publisher time too in, 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 in doing that. So, uh, you know, I think we want to have reasonable solutions. If funders are wanting that sort of thing, then absolutely they have to pay for it, okay? But I think there has to be a debate within the whole community about, you know, how much worth... Uh, there isn't that. Some things are good ideas, but they're too expensive to implement um, at the moment. So, so we, we should certainly talk about it. Any other questions? It's more of a comment in response to that. I, I think there are many publishers now who are already automating that sort of service and asking authors for contributions, and it doesn't take a huge amount of, uh, of time. I know many medical journals do this. Uh, PLOS Medicine does this, and, and other, the other journals are PLOS. Um, and I think if we are to look at incentives, we have to provide incentives um, um, for researchers to demonstrate that the work is reliable. Things like author contributions, um, transparent reporting, fuller reporting of uh, what um, authors do in the papers and uh, rewarding reviewers for evaluating that aspect of the paper. And at the moment, there is, there is no incentive from funders for researchers to do that. Um, there are no incentives for publishers to have that as part of their um, evaluation and peer review criteria. I don't think these are really difficult things um, technologically to add to the peer review process. It's, it's about actually providing incentives and the reasons and justifications. And I don't think those incentives for researchers are financial. Um, it's, about, it's about making your data and, you, and the, the, your paper more easily reusable uh, by your colleagues. Uh, I think there's uh, different things. Uh, Stephen, did you have a question? Yeah. Hey, Stephen Pinfield from the University of Sheffield. <coughs> uh, you, you were on the uh, project group looking at metrics for the REF, as you said. HEFC have done this once before. <laughs> Uh, at least once before, several years ago, looking at the role of metrics in the research assessment activity that they carry out, and, and published their findings to the community, and there was, a, there was a sort of very negative reaction, and they rode back from, you know, metrics-driven assessment informed by peer review to a peer-reviewed system informed by metrics, and then that, the metrics it disappeared in the distance in the end. Um, so what are your impressions of the reception of the work that you've done and how do you think it's going to impact on assessment? And is, is it informing not just the UK but other countries as well? Because that, that can happen, can't it? So. Uh, yes, and well, in, in turn, our work was informed by work that's already been done in places like Canada and the United mm. States, who had, uh, had looked at these sorts of things. So at the moment in the REF, um, there's sort of uh, a number of panels who look at particular disciplines, and some of the sub-panels within those 
uh, did ask for bibliometric data, which they were provided with. I mean, it was citations, numbers to the individual papers that they were assessing. Some panels didn't want that data. In general, they, you know, so the HFC did an awful lot of sort of post you know, debriefing of the panels afterwards, and the citation data was usually only used in a sort of tie-break situation where they were looking at two papers and they were trying to figure out, okay, well, which one of these is, is, is better, and then they would look at the citation data. So in that sense, it was kind of fairly low-key. It was used to inform the judgment just to add a little bit more information to the mix before then a judgment was made. But it wasn't the case that they were then, they just looked at the numbers and said, okay, that's got so many citations, give that a three-star rather than a four star and I think probably there will be more use of metrics I mean uh, in future but the recommendation certainly from the report is that certainly as far as the ref goes then it'll still be based on peer review that's what in, in, for this exercise certainly the vast majority of researchers feel most comfortable with it's considered the gold standard but of course there are many problems there are lots of biases in it you know even sort of biases between uh, gender and uh, diversity and sort of ethnic minorities worry that they get dis you know deserved by this and there the sort of metric information can actually can sometimes come back and challenge um, those biases because you see okay even though it was written by a woman actually it's got lots of citations and you know so sadly things like that do still happen in, a, in this day and age but the the metric information can be can be sometimes helpful in addressing that uh, Michael? It seems to me, um, Stephen, that the sort of nirvana that, you're, that you, uh, you outline is already there in lots of experiments going on. None of, none of the, the desirable features that you, you put up does not exist uh, at, at, at the moment. But it seems to me that most of, most of the services that are being provided uh, in terms of a scholarly communication system, and I'm deliberately not just talking about publishing, are driven by incentives for, that, uh, that are perceived by researchers. Incentives uh, that are essentially built around competition and f competition for scholarly credit. You argued that one particular quite small change uh, in the way in which the impact factor is, is advertised would deliver all kinds of uh, pay payback. How do, how do you think that, that such a small change would have such a broad cultural uh, impact uh, in changing the views of, 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 of researchers, uh, which are very, very strongly embedded in this culture of competition? Well, I'm a, a sort of pragmatic fundamentalist in a way, which is why nothing that I said was really wholly revolutionary. You're right. I don't know that it will have that effect. I didn't predict that it would. I just said that it's something worth trying, and that it might. And you know, you know, you know, one should never make predictions, particularly about the future. And so, you know, I I don't know if it will change. I think there's still a battle there, but I think it's part of the process, and that's part of a process that's building on other initiatives like the Leiden Manifesto, like Dora. You know, people are talking about these things more and more. And I think there is more awareness. You will still get grant committees sitting around, and they will just look at the titles of the journals. They won't even read. The, the title of the paper, and they'll be starting to sort of rack up their assessment there and then. And we do have to challenge that behavior, and we have to enable alternatives to that that are efficient and effective for you know very busy people making these assessments. So there isn't there isn't a, a, a revolution to be had based on one particular movement, but there are lots of steps that one can take in the right direction. And having taken a lot of steps, suddenly you might find as you turn around, that you're in a very different place. And so that is how I see the, the, the journey happening. It's, it's going to be baby steps because uh, researchers are you know, very willful people. Yeah, time for maybe one more question. OK, well, I have a question, actually, leading on from Michael's. Um, you were talking about enforcing price sensitivity among authors as well, or encouraging price sensitivity among authors. How, how do you think you could go about that? Well, one of the things that I would encourage some funders to do is to put a cap on the money that they make available to researchers 
uh, for APCs. So you saw the data that Salvatore presented yesterday about the difference in prices that uh, people in the UK are paying versus people in Germany. And in the UK, we're paying a lot more um, on average. And uh, I, you know, I've talked to the welcome about this. They feel putting a cap is a bit crude. But, and I think actually uh, funders are a little bit, you know, the, they use kid gloves sometimes when they're handling researchers. And I think they should be a bit tougher and a bit more gung-ho, and they should simply, you know, make academics uh, uh, have a sense of responsibility for spending. You know, if you want to go and actually buy equipment, you're supposed to go out and get, you know, three quotations for tenders and whatnot. If you're going to spend that amount of money, so you get really good value for money, that doesn't happen in uh, in publishing. When I travel uh, for the university, I travel standard class. You know, I'm not allowed to travel first class for the very good reason that it's a lot more expensive. It's not more effective. It doesn't get me from A to B any more quickly traveling first class, so it's not worth paying for from that point of view. But there doesn't seem to be that restriction placed on publishing. So that's more a question of value for money though, than an actual... An oh, yes, that. it's value for money. I don't, I'm not saying that you know, everybody should be paying peanuts, or whatever, but if there's a really good service there that's worth paying for, then yeah, we should, we should pay for it. I'm, I'm interested in quality. And can you recommend any better Nicolas Cage movies than Knowing? Oh, yeah. Um, um, Con Air is just fantastic. Yeah. Right, OK. Well, um, thank you, Stephen. I know you have to take a flight. Hopefully it won't be like Con Air. Uh, but, uh, thank, thank you. Hopefully not. Give me a round of applause for Stephen. Please.